Okay, can you all hear me? Can I get everybody's attention for just a minute? Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce to you uh, George Pollard, who's going to speak to us on uh, Kairos Ministry. Uh, George and his wife Pam are here. Um, George has been a, uh, a longtime member of the, the uh, Woodlands United Methodist Church. He is a uh, men's Bible study fellowship leader and uh, has been involved in the uh, Kairos ministry for some time. And I look forward very much, and I'm sure you do, to uh, hearing what he has to say about it. Say again? Okay. Anyway, with uh, no further real ado, uh, I'd like to introduce George to you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good song. <laughs> you have that one off. <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to open with a prayer. Dear gracious God Almighty, we just uh, thank you for this ministry. Uh, we thank you for uh, all these men and women who love you and uh, are anxious to hear about uh, the mighty work you're doing in your kingdom. We ask that you bless this time together, uh, take away any distractions, and Lord, you know the passion I have for this ministry. And we just pray that uh, uh, that you would guide me in everything that I say. In Christ's name, I pray. But prison ministry, uh, if you're like George Pollard was, at, uh, is that, is that got quite a bit of feedback there? Both mics might be on. Uh, Are both mics on? Uh, no, you turned this one back off. I did. Uh, I'll just get a little bit further away from it. Uh, uh, if you're like George Pollard was about 13 years ago, when people started talking about prison ministry, I said, you know, that's really great. Uh, I know Jesus asked us to go and visit the prisons. Uh, and uh, as Pat closed out uh, the luncheon last time, he said, go out and spread the gospel to all the world. He didn't say except prisons. Uh, and there are a bunch of people there. Uh, and so I know, I know people need to go there and visit those prisoners. And I'm really glad you do it because I don't think that's for me. Uh, and, uh, and then I got into uh, approaching retirement and uh, I had been blessed and retired with good health uh, and, uh, and aptly provided for, and, uh, and that was a blessing. And so I was praying, God, how he wanted to use some of my retirement time. And, uh, of course, I don't know about y'all, but when I pray, I tend to put them in a box when I'm looking for answers. And I kind of figured it was maybe do a little bit more Bible study uh, or, uh, or maybe uh, work more on uh, or do some uh, short-term mission trips. I was really interested in some short-term mission trips. I hadn't done that at the time. Uh, and, uh, and he kept putting these people from Tyro's prison ministry in front of me. And they kept talking to me about the prison ministry. And I, my first reaction is, yeah, that's great. I know God wants you to do it. I spent all my life trying to stay out of places like that. And now he wants me to walk in voluntarily <laughs> and be involved in that. And, uh, and yet they kept on talking, and God has a sense of humor, as, as Dick mentioned, I'm a leader in Bible study fellowship, and one of the guys in my group, a guy by the name of Stoney, uh, and uh, Stoney was very active in the Kairos prison ministry, uh, and, and so every, and I've tried to contact my guys about once a week, and every time I got Stoney, rather than talking about the Bible scriptures that we were studying, he wanted to talk about Kairos. Uh, and then finally, uh, and he said, you really ought to consider it. And uh, I, I finally said, uh, well, Stoney, I'm praying about it, and I'm not getting anything. And I really wasn't. I wasn't getting any of these visions of me in a prison or any of that kind of stuff. And, uh, and one day he called, and he said, okay, we're forming a team at Terrell, and I'd like for you to think about joining us. And I said, well, I've been praying about it, and I still haven't gotten anything, but... I'll pray about it for the next two days, and I'll let you know it's coming. And I did pray. Uh, and, uh, and on the second day, my devotional was, sometimes God wants you to step out and faith. Mm -hmm. Now, that is, that is 
just too much out of here, you know. So I figured I might be going against Scott. So I'll, I called Sony up and I said, okay, Sony, I'll do one. I'm just going to do one Kairos weekend. And, uh, uh, and I'll do the commitment for the follow-up that you have for the six months afterwards. Uh, but I'm going to have to see what God is doing with this before I go forth any further than that. And so uh, uh, I did that one uh, in uh, April of 2001 uh, at the Terrell unit. Uh, and I've been at it hard and heavy ever since. It was a blessing. It was a blessing. It's a, it's a, it, this ministry gives me an opportunity to go in there and see guys on Thursday who come in these guys, we go, the purpose of the Kairos ministry is to, is to create a Christian community in the unit. So you have to go to maximum and medium security units uh, because you will go to people where they won't be there for a while if you're going to create a Christian community. And so on, I've been blessed to see guys, uh, to see how God can take a guy who walks in on Thursday afternoon uh, who has a very hardened uh, life, all their life, uh, had done some really nasty things, uh, and, and uh, had never thought about Jesus until Thursday. Uh, and on Sunday afternoon at our closing, that same big mean guy is sitting up here in front of probably 300 people now, uh, and, and giving his testimony about how, with tears running down his eyes, how he found Jesus over that week. I don't know about you, but I've got some of the guys I used to work fish with that I've worked on for 30 years and they hadn't gotten it yet. And so it's just got to be the power of the Holy Spirit uh, that works through in a mighty way in that weekend. And, uh, and God is, uh, because I finally gave in, uh, God has blessed me with an opportunity to just be, uh, be able to see Him you know, do that. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the particular unit that I work in. Uh, and then I'll tell you uh, a little bit about uh, Kairos and what the format is. And, but what I'd like to do is, is share also some of the stories, uh, some of the real life stories that, that, that kind of punctuate this. Uh, and so uh, I'll start out with the Easton unit uh, is, uh, is where I've been working for uh, most of my time. Uh, I got involved in the very early stages of forming the Kairos uh, on that. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an old farm. It's over 100 years old. Uh, and uh, it's uh, you know, 13 acres. Uh, they got whole squats as an HOE. Uh, and uh, and it uh, happens to be the place that, uh, that uh, Bonnie actually broke Clyde out of. Uh, and so it's been around for a long time. It's a medium maximum security unit. It has about 2,200 inmates. Uh, and in 19, I believe it was 89, uh, we had the uh, uh, Newsweek, 18, 1986, October 1986, Newsweek read a code, cover article on this unit called it Inside America's Toughest Prison. Uh, and it, it had been dubbed 60 Minutes to the Peace Sign 2 that this was the meanest prison in all of the United States. Uh, talked to some of those. Some of the old timers that were there, and they said, "Yeah, there was, you know, bloods in the hall. There was fight every day. What unusual for a couple of people to get killed a year, uh, and it was a nasty place to go. Uh, and uh, I can tell you today, it's, it's probably one of the dream locations if you <laughs> if you have to be incarcerated. Uh, they have a very, and it's not just because of Kairos. It's it's just because of some really active uh, chaplaincy programs uh, and." Uh, and they have a strong, uh, strong uh, program now. And as a matter of fact, it's gotten so big and so large, they actually converted one of their two gyms uh, to the chapel uh, because the small chapel they had was too small. Uh, and now they have a big, nice gym that's been converted to a chapel, the sound system, and all kinds of things you tend to not, even air conditioning that you tend to not see in a, in a correctional unit. So that, that's Easton. Um, the, uh, Kairos uh, ministry, uh, Kairos is, is, uh, is a Greek word, uh, and I've heard it pronounced a number of times. Uh, my ministers tend to pronounce it 
of kairos, kairos, or something like that, which is probably a correct Greek term. But it's one that it basically says it's, it's one of the Greek words that expresses God's time as opposed to chronos, which is kind of a more accurate. Uh, a chronos time would be your chronometer, your watch, uh, or, your, or your calendar, or kairos is God's time. And that's kind of, all this happens in God's time. Uh, there, are, there are several stages of it, uh, but the foundation of it is what we call that Kairos weekend, which is Thursday, uh, Thursday uh, through Sunday, in which uh, about 30 uh, inside guys from, the, guys from the outside are part of what we call the inside team, and, uh, and they meet with about, well, with 42 uh, inmates uh, and uh, spend that weekend telling them about, uh, tell them about Christ and how you make a difference in your life. We tell them we're not going to change the sentence that they're going to serve, but we're going to certainly change, change how they serve it. Uh, and that's, that's what our intent is. Uh, on Thursday is basically a one-on-one -on -one time. We're paired up with one or two of the inmates, spend a little time with them, get them comfortable with it. Uh, Friday is when we really get started. There, uh, there are seven tables. Of, of nine uh, people at each table, three from the outside and six uh, of the inmates. Uh, and uh, on Friday morning, we start with a series of talks uh, that uh, start with choices. Uh, you can get their attention when you start talking about choices. They've all made choices, and some, and most of them, they haven't been too proud of at this point. Uh, and uh, uh, and the format is we talk, give them, uh, give them a talk. Outside team members who might give talks uh, and, and share their own personal testimony, uh, and then uh, and then we discuss it at the table. Uh, and, and the intent of being at this table for this whole period of time is to, to get those guys to begin to bond and uh, get them to at least look at that. Because what we're going with it is at this we create a prayer and share group where they meet. It's kind of an accountability group that they meet every Saturday, uh, and they become, on the weekend, they become comfortable meeting and sharing with each other. So we have a uh, discussion about what they got out of the talk, and then we do what, what seems like the craziest thing in the world. We then have them do a poster uh, about what that talk meant to them as a table. It unifies them as a table all working on it. They all have to participate in the poster. Uh, and, uh, and it is a hoot when you think about, you know, some of these big old Vulcan guys or gang leaders, all of a sudden they got markers on a poster and they're, they're, they're drawing their stick figures as to what, what that meant. Uh, and first time I heard that, I thought, man, that ain't work. These guys don't say, I ain't going to do that. Uh, but somehow it works. Power of the Holy Spirit and they start having fun doing it. Uh, and so they, you know, you have to keep them discussing what they got out of it before they jump on the poster. Uh, and, uh, and, and so then that, that continues with that format. The next one is you're not alone, which is particularly important because uh, the team solicits prayers. And people would be praying for that weekend, over that weekend. Uh, and if you commit to do that, you send a little slip of paper uh, saying that you're going to do it. We make an old paper chain out of all those slips of paper. Uh, and during that talk, we come in and and spread that paper chain all around the room where we're meeting. Uh, so they have constant reminder that people are praying for them the whole time. Guys are impacted by that. And they say, you know, but I don't think anybody's ever prayed for me. I had one guy say, no, I do I think anybody's ever prayed for me? I've never thought about prayer. 58-year-old man who had run a successful business out there and never prayed in his life. But he did that later, and he became the prayer leader in a small group. Uh, and, and, and so that it continues on with basically talks uh, on Friday. Uh, then Saturday is, is a powerful day. Uh, Friday, Saturday, we introduce uh, what we call spiritual counseling. If anybody wants one-on-one -on -one with a clergy, we usually have four or five clergy on the team. Uh, and uh, speaking of clergy, I meant to tell you, Easton's got a brand new chapel. Uh, that just started at the first of the year. Uh, and it's Tommy Lyles, who used to be uh, the senior pastor at 
Tom Ball, I'm a United Methodist Church. And, uh, I was having lunch with Tommy uh, at the Eastern Union uh, just this Saturday. And he said, be sure to tell everybody hi, because he has had come here. Wasn't a regular he had to have been, but he hadn't been here before. Uh, so Tommy said hi. Uh, but anyway, we give them an opportunity for spiritual counseling. So they get to have some one-on-one -on -one counseling if they would like. Uh, one of the things I love is on Saturday morning we get together as a, as a table family, but we go away in a secluded spot and get in a circle, uh, and we have a cross, one cross, and we have a prayer circle, and and you just uh, the, the table leader explains to them that we're just going to do simple prayers, nothing complicated. All the outside guys make a point of making these prayers simple so that they become comfortable <coughs> giving that prayer. And uh, and uh, so then we'll we'll start out the table letter start out with a simple prayer and then he'll pass that cross uh, to the next guy who can then pass it on if he doesn't want to or he can hold it and do a silent prayer uh, or he can can make a prayer and uh, uh, they don't always pray the first time around but then we go around the second time uh, and it is amazing uh, it is amazing to see them all of a sudden talking to God. Uh, and uh, I, I remember two occasions where uh, people actually did the Sunday prayer, accepted Christ and confessed their sins uh, uh, right there in that prayer circle. So it's, it's always uh, warm to me to watch these guys experience in prayer uh, many times for the first time. Uh, another highlight for Saturday is uh, they get a bunch of letters. All the team members write letters. Uh, other people on the outside who want to write letters uh, write letters. Uh, and right after lunch, we let them spend time, uh, give them a little bit of time to read those letters. These letters are sealed. They never get a sealed letter. Uh, and what's more important is uh, probably half of them don't get letters at all. Uh, and uh, they always, uh, there's always really teary eyes after they get through that, that somebody thought enough of them to sit down and write when they haven't heard from their family. And, 15 years and, uh, and so it's just it, that's part of what this ministry is our motto is listen listen love love and we just love them to death uh, and give them stuff that they that they've never seen before um, uh, a big portion a big emphasis on uh, saturday and our discussions and our talks and our meditations are about forgiveness uh, and uh, because that's the big hurdle that's the big stomach block got a lot of baggage, they got a lot of anger against some people, they got forgives some people starting with themselves, and, uh, and so that's a, that's a big hurdle for them. And so we kind of spend the whole day kind of working through thinking about forgiveness of themselves, of others, uh, and we give them a little slip of paper, which is actually a kind of flash paper, and we ask them to be writing down what they want, what, what, what they want to forgive. Uh, and several times during the course of time, give me time to, to, to write that down uh, and, and keep that. And uh, we uh, we have, well, we have, that the very last thing that we do on that day is uh, is to spend, uh, we have a forgiveness ceremony that the chapel uh, does, conducts, and tells them about how Jesus forgives. Uh, Chaplain Drum, who was chaplain before, had one that's as good. <laughs> he says, he takes all your confessions and all your requests for forgiveness, and he takes them and he throws them out in the ocean, right in the deep part of the ocean, and he puts up a no fishing sign. Yeah. <laughs> and it was always a graphic picture to me. But, uh, so we're talking about how quickly Jesus can lift up that burden. Uh, and then we have a ceremony where they go and put that slip of paper on a spike that's on a, on a cross. Uh, and, uh, and then after they've all done that, uh, uh, the chaplain points out, uh, Jesus forgives in an instance, and we put uh, a lighter to that, that stack of uh, flash paper, and in a second, it's gone. Uh, and that's the point as that room ever gets. Those guys just think about it. That it just goes that quickly, uh, and and that's how we leave them for that night uh, to go and think about all the burden they left up on that cross, uh, and that is just a uh, 
they come back with different people uh, Sunday morning. Uh, one, of, one of the things we do before that uh, is we have an open mic uh, where we have guys that get the opportunity to, if they want to, to say what they're getting out this weekend. Uh, and many guys uh, at that point have already accepted Christ. Uh, and, uh, and so that's always, a, that's always a special time as well. Uh, but, but the key is wrapping up with that forgiveness uh, set for me. A Sunday is pretty much, uh, uh, you know, kind of picking up from where you left uh, with forgiveness. Uh, we emphasize don't be going to that fishing hole. You know, we don't want you going back and picking up that stuff you left on the cross uh, and moving forward. So that Sunday is dedicated uh, towards moving uh, forward. Uh, a couple of special things. Uh, we have another prayer time. This time where each individual goes around and puts their hands on his table, everybody at the table, and he offers personal prayer for each one of those people. Because at this point in time, they've become very blunt, uh, and, uh, and, and it's powerful to hear uh, some of those prayers for people, uh, and, uh, and, and a blessing to be prayed on uh, by those guys. And then, uh, and then we present them with a cross, says Jesus is counting on you and your response is and I'm counting on Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and then after that we do this kind of back in the back room uh, and after that uh, we've been setting up in this large, what was gym is now a chapel uh, and uh, bring, bringing in people from the outside who have asked to come to closing uh, and, uh, and any, any of the uh, active Kairos Guys who have been through Kairos in the unit uh, that can and want to come uh, will come. And so all of those guys fill that place. Uh, it's not uncommon to have 100 people from the outside. Uh, and we have well over 200 guys from the inside. So it's, uh, it's a pretty crowded place at this time when we have the closing. Uh, and, uh, and then we take those guys down. Uh, and, uh, of course, everybody's cheering for them. Uh, and we give those guys, the guys that have been through the weekend, an opportunity to give their personal testimony. Uh, and uh, that, uh, if you'd ever like to attend the closing, it, it's well worth the price. Because <laughs> it costs nothing other than a trip to Eastman. Uh, and you hear, you hear some of the stories uh, about the journey that they made just in that three and a half days. So uh, that's, a power, that's a powerful, powerful story. Uh, after the weekend, uh, one of the things about this ministry is we don't quit there. Uh, after the ministry, we meet again with those same 42 guys uh, the following Saturday, and we teach them how to do those prayer and shares. Uh, we do take a half a morning and, and teach them how to do these accountability groups. And then after that, uh, every Saturday, they do a prayer and share uh, and with the Kairos volunteer there because you have to have a some sort of outside volunteer for those. Uh, and, then, uh, and then on the second Saturday of each month, we go back and have what we call a Kairos reunion, which is everybody that's been through Kairos uh, can come and we have a time of praise, worship, music. Uh, we have a lot of music on the weekend too, which is interesting. We'll start watching some of these guys sing that have never sung them before. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so we have praise, worship, there's some testimony, uh, and then we break up into, uh, into small accountability groups uh, with uh, Kairos representative with each of the group, uh, an outside guy, to basically ask him, okay, how's God working in your life? Uh, what's he doing? Uh, and, uh, and that's a blessing too. Uh, uh, Pam tells a story that when I got into the Kairos the first time, part of the commitment is you're gonna go back on this this uh, Saturday, one Saturday a week, uh, to do these reunions. And the first time, I go, oh man, you know, here I, I got to get up, you know, 5:30 to, to get there. And this is on Saturday, you know. I don't have to work, and you know, that's the only time I don't have to set an alarm, you know, because I, I got church activities on Sunday and I work there and I work there. Ah, oh, do I really want to do this? And, and so I would grud I grudgingly got up and went. Uh, and uh, and that happened the first time. And the second time, I couldn't wait to get there. 
because it's so awesome to see how God has worked in those people's lives in just just that just that one month. And so that was kind of, kind of that was really a blessing. Uh, thinking about some of those, some of the guys that I would uh, like to share a story with, uh, uh, one of them came to mind. We refer to him now as Arian Ralph. Uh, this this was actually the first time I worked at Eastern, uh, and we're sitting at a table. I'm a table leader. That's part of the reason why I came over is they needed somebody with some experience, and because they were just getting started uh, there, and I was a table leader. And uh, one thing you don't do is get comfortable in doing in this activity. Because <laughs> that's just when uh, God has a sense of humor. And, and I may have been a little bit comfortable because I had some experience and we were just starting up there. You tend to have uh, two, two, two uh, white, two Caucasians, two black, and two Hispanic uh, at a table uh, to, to keep a mix. And that's pretty well representative of what, what the units look like. Uh, and uh, and so we're sitting there, we're cooking along, uh, and about mid-Friday morning, uh, which we're just getting started, you know, I think we had one talk we were discussing the second talk. And uh, and this guy was around, uh, who was a white guy, and he says, uh, well, you don't know me, but and I think he was probably referring to those of us on the outside. But before he could finish his sentence, uh, we had a black guy, uh, Frederick, who jumped out. He says, I know you. I know you. I know about you. I know what you stand for. And I don't like any of them. And a Hispanic guy who, who, uh, who I believe at the time uh, David was part of the Mexican Mafia, was, was he jumped out. And he said, and I hate you even more than he does. <laughs> you know about bullet prayers, don't you? <laughs> well, old George was setting up those bullet players. God, we need help on this thing. I'm getting ready to have a meltdown right here at this table just as we're getting started. And uh, I said, well, guys, let's, we're coming in here fresh. Uh, and uh, we're all having an opportunity uh, to, to see what this is about. So I just ask that you put that kind of stuff, leave it outside, and let's just follow what we're talking about on this weekend and they agreed to do that uh, and as of course the weekend came along uh, the problem was uh, Ralph was one of the two Aryan gang leaders uh, in that for the Aryan gang uh, white supremacists uh, and he didn't have any use and he raised his whole life he didn't have any use uh, for Hispanic or black uh, and it was pretty clear about it in the unit uh, also, Ralph, through the course of the weekend, found these were pretty neat guys. As a matter of fact, he and Frederick, Frederick got to be really good. He, he found out Frederick was better, was, was, was a nicer and, and more interesting guy than anybody else he knew. And he got to thinking that other guys he'd been running around with were pretty bland, you know? And, and the next thing I know, they're good buddies. And, and then at that closing I'm telling you about, uh, Ralph got up and he talked about uh, how he'd asked Christ to forgive him uh, for all of his past and for his biases. Uh, and said through this weekend, he had found out, he had found uh, that uh, these men of color have a lot more to offer than he had ever uh, willing to accept. And he said, as a matter of fact, I'd like to introduce you to my new best friend. And he called Frederick up, and there where they were hanging, hanging together. Uh, just with a smile, uh, and uh, and they stayed friends until Frederick got out first, and, and Ralph has just recently gotten out. But it was a whole transformation of a lifetime, just turned around through the power of the Holy Spirit. We, uh, I, uh, I also like to like to tell the story of uh, Larry Haynes. He's one of the favorite ones out of our out of our group. Bob probably Bob Baldwin has worked with me in the past on that. Many years, and Larry was one of our favorite stories. Uh, Larry Haynes was was uh, Larry just didn't talk. He didn't want to have it. Larry. The way Larry dealt with his time is he just didn't want to spend time with anybody. Uh, and so 
when Larry came to the weekend, he would just sit there. And there was nothing. I mean, no expression, no conversation. Uh, he, he wouldn't participate in the discussion at the table. He just sat there. And uh, he was at a table right next to mine, and I kept noticing uh, Larry, and I wondered, you know, is this guy alive? Uh, he wasn't getting it. I mean, we've got some pretty powerful stuff going on in the you know. He's not, there's nothing in there, you know. And uh, so I asked uh, uh, their friend who was the table leader on the next, on the next thing, and I said, Jim, is, is that Larry Haynes getting any of this? He said, no, I don't know. He said, We've been discussing it. Uh, we talked, you have some stewards who have worked a weekend before that kind of help you out. Uh, they've been through the weekend and then there are servers and that kind of stuff. We talked to those guys. They said, I've never seen a guy talk. So that's nothing unusual to them. Uh, and so Larry sat there and sure enough, he went through all this cool stuff I was telling you about Saturday and still nothing. We were talking about well, you know, there's some guys that maybe just aren't going to get it. Just aren't going to get it. Uh, and, then, uh, and then Saturday morning, we came in, and Larry had a smile on his face. And, and, uh, and he started talking. And, you know, Jim had, Jim had even, they made arrangements to move Jim around next to this guy, because Jim had a lot of experience, and he wanted to see if he could find out what it was. But well, then they, all of a sudden, Larry was all talkative and he wanted to hear all about this. And, and, and it turns out he'd been taking all this stuff in uh, and he processed it that night. But the thing that got him over the, you know, kind of pushing, I guess, to the, over the brink was he was reading those letters. They take, their, they take those letters back to their cells. Uh, and he spent most of the night going through those letters and reading them. Uh, and there was one letter from a little girl uh, named Amber, uh, and, uh, and she said, uh, I hope you love your cookies. I'm praying for you, and Jesus loves you, and I do too, Amber. And that one, he just broke down and cried like a baby. And he still, you know, he cares uh, and what impact that is. You talk about God having a way of doing things. Guess whose daughter Amber was? Jim, the table leader who was sitting right next to him. And so they instantly had a bond. Uh, and, uh, and Larry had a complete transformation. He accepted Christ. He was on fire for Christ. He got active in the church. He became the leader uh, of the inside Carroll's community. Uh, they rotated leadership for, for a period of time. And Larry became the leader. This is a guy nobody had ever heard talk. And all of a sudden he's leading the group. Uh, and at, at our closing, he has a, uh, he has a, we have what we call a fourth day speaker, and, and he was actually the speaker. And if anybody had ever thought Larry Haynes was going to be the speaker, he was. Uh, the significant thing about that is Larry uh, uh, contracted uh, hepatitis and really got advanced on him, uh, and, uh, and it took his life. As he was going through the process of dying, they were transferring him to medical centers. And Larry was going around with his IV, going around telling everybody, Do you know Christ? Because you need to know Christ. If you're in a place like this, you better get yourself square with Christ. And, and, and the people there said they don't know how many people he led to Christ before he, before he died. Uh, but the, the great thing, and some of us were actually able to go to his funeral service. Uh, is we know where Larry is. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, and uh, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit and that transformation and a little old simple letter from Amber uh, that had, uh, had a powerful story. And then I'll, I'll, fin I'll finish up with one more and then I'll ask for questions. And, and this is a guy by the name of Tommy. Uh, and Tommy was a, a one of the leaders uh, in the blood, uh, which is a, a big game. Uh, and uh, Tommy was at my table uh, that particular weekend, and uh, <clears throat> he's never admitted it. Uh, but I believe Tommy was there to be an enforcer. Uh, they were having a lot of game. You have a lot of game members that 
convert to Christianity and what they call throw down their flag and leave the game. Uh, and uh, and Tommy was there to make sure no more boys did that. You know? And uh, so he came in and had a stern face, had a stern face all day Friday. He started asking me, he says, George, he says, how come you're smiling about it? And I just answered, that's a love of Jesus shining through, Tommy. And uh, he'd shake his hand and head. He participated. He did all the things. And he was, you know, he wasn't being a, any kind of instructions or anything. And, uh, and then Saturday morning, after we had that prayer circle, uh, and we started talking about uh, the, the talk, uh, and uh, there was a little smile on uh, Tommy. And I said, Tommy, is that a smile coming out on you? What is that? He says, that may be some of your Jesus coming in to me, George. <laughs> well, Jesus came into him over that weekend in, uh, in a powerful way. Uh, and I can tell you that those guys are powerful gang leaders can be very strong Christian leaders, too. Tommy was a big leader in the church, uh, taught Sunday school, uh, was actively involved. He got in contact with his girlfriend. Tommy had been in, in jail for 20 years. Uh, he contacted his old girlfriend who he had consciously led away from the church because the church got in the way with the activities he wanted to do uh, and he didn't if he was going to have a relationship with her he didn't want to let that let that go uh, he didn't want the church in the way uh, and so he contacted her told her how he was wrong how he had discovered Christ and, and talked her back into going into, going to church uh, and about a couple of years ago, uh, Tommy got out, uh, and he and Patricia got married, uh, and uh, and he's he's doing uh, just a wonderful job on the outside. He's keeping keeping his faith walk, uh, and uh, has started his own landscaping business. He worked got a couple of jobs when he came out. I uh, got working out. He and Patricia have their own landscaping business, uh, and they're doing just fine. We saw both of them uh, at the Eastern Appreciation Dinner on. Uh, this is December. Uh, so it is powerful. It's powerful to see God work and uh, see how he can, can do things. And that's why I like Kairos. That's why I like prison ministry. It's kind of the best best place to watch God work I've ever seen. And with that, I'll, I kind of open it up to any questions that you might have. I think we have a couple of minutes. Where is East of is, uh, is about 25 miles north of Huntsville. Uh, and you got to be going there. <laughs> you don't drive by that unit. It's not one of those units on I-45 or anything. you got to go to that unit.
and the warden uh, select those, and they try to find guys that are the leaders, maybe not for the right kinds of things. Uh, so it's not uncommon for us to get uh, gang leaders and, and that kind of stuff in there. Uh, typically, at the table, there will be one person who is a Christian and uh, is actively involved, and, and maybe one on the fringe, and the other four, uh, like Chaplain Drone used to say, I've never heard of them. They're, they're invited, once they come up to 42, they're invited to come and talk to Chaplain Drum. He tells them what it's about, and he asks them if they want to participate. It's purely voluntary. Uh, and, uh, and so that's how the 42 are, are selected. Uh, uh, we find out who they are when we walk in the door on, on Thursday. Actually, we find out a little bit before that, because Chaplain gives us a list of them so we can be praying for them. We get a list about a week ahead of time so we can pray specifically for them. Okay, I'm getting close. I'm running out of time. I promised to get it. See, I'm two or three minutes, and I'm just barely not doing that. <laughs> Thank you very much.